good morning, everyone. It's always very difficult to speak uh, after such an inspirational uh, speaker. But uh, first, uh, I would like to express uh, my delight of being here today. I would like to express my delight for having the opportunity to address you. And I would like to very warmly thank Minister Bartolo for the invitation, but uh, also for your great uh, hospitality and, of course, for your really very inspirational, very insightful and forward-looking <coughs> speech. Uh, your presidency, Minister, has only just begun, but you have already sent an important signal on the key role of education for your government, for your country, for the EU and the world at large. And you've just mentioned the importance that uh, we need to have alignment between what is happening in the education area and what is happening outside. And I believe these are really very important things. On Monday and Tuesday, we had the conference on school leadership. And yesterday, we had the joint meeting of two of our working groups, looking at the changing role of the teacher in higher education. We know that much has been done in Malta to modernize curricula, to improve the quality of teaching, and to promote digital skills. And we look forward to learning more about your experience as well as the experience of uh, other countries over the next two days. But we also look very much forward to working with you over the next six months of your presidency on education generally and digital education in particular. The themes of this conference, digital education, young people, skills, lifelong learning are of critical importance to the European Commission. One of the main priorities of President Juncker's Commission is to leverage the huge potential of the digital single market for growth, jobs, and innovation. A special priority for the Commission in terms of boosting growth and jobs is, of course, to support young people in Europe. Of the 90 million young Europeans, 27 million, almost one-third, are at risk of poverty and social exclusion. 14 million are neither in a job nor in education or training. Education clearly plays a key role here. Young people who have had the chance of gaining the right skills from early on are much better placed to find a job. And employment is still the best safety net against exclusion. At European level, we are providing funding through programs like Erasmus+, Plus, as you know very well, uh, to help young people get extra study or work experience abroad to increase their chances of employment. I want to particularly highlight the Erasmus program, which celebrates its 30th anniversary this year. It has given 5 million students the chance to travel, study, and train across Europe. In addition, I would like to recall that the new youth initiative, which was adopted by the Commission last December, has a strong educational strand, recognizing the strategic importance of education and training for our society and for our economic development. Talking about digital, we all agree that the ongoing digital transformation is a challenge for our economy, for our society, and it is a challenge for education too. Over the past 10 years, we have been witnessing an incredible pace of technological development, which is bringing an immense change to the world we live in. Jobs are changing, skills are changing, the way we communicate, entertain, shop and vote is changing too. Self-driving cars are on the roads, the use of drones becomes increasingly wide, and artificial intelligence and robotics are expanding at a rapid pace. Ten years ago, no one would have imagined that the iPhone would revolutionize the world the way it did. 
And none of us knows now what the world will look like in five, 10, or 20 years' time. But what we do know is that whatever the world will look like, it will be more digital. So the question is, do we have the right skills today to cope with the challenges of tomorrow? And if we are to be honest with ourselves, we probably don't. What is therefore, therefore highly important to do is to prepare, in particular, our children for the new future. We need to prepare them to work, live, and thrive in a digital world, in a world which will be vastly different from today. This might be the biggest task Europe's education systems have faced yet. Last year, with our skills agenda, the Commission placed the topic of skills on the top of the political agenda. We are working to make sure that the skills gaps and needs are taken seriously and addressed across the EU. And we are working closely with the Member States to raise the quality of education and training in Europe. One of the main challenges lying ahead of us is to make education relevant, and that was an issue that was also very strongly underlined by Minister Bartolo. To increase student engagement and performance, we must also focus on updating learning content and ensuring that it is relevant to today's rapid changing environment and to lives of young people. Literacy, numeracy, languages and sciences have long been the focus of education systems across the EU. But we need to reach wider to ensure our young people are digitally competent, have entrepreneurial skills, and develop media literacy and key skills such as critical thinking. At European level, we are witnessing a transformation of education systems towards competence-based teaching. The aim is no longer to equip students with a specific piece of knowledge or one concrete skill, but to help students develop the foundations of a wider competence that they can develop further as they wish or they need. We have supported and encouraged this approach for many years, but we hope to give a further push to this effort with the revision of the European Key Competencies Framework later this year. And I would like to inform you that the Commission will launch a public consultation in February, and I would like to uh, strongly invite you to provide your contributions and participate in this consultation. As you know, the framework sets out eight key competencies and a series of transversal skills, which the Commission and experts across the EU believe are vital in the Europe of today. One of the eight competencies is, of course, directly linked to the topic of today, digital competencies. All of us here recognize the critical importance of digital skills and competencies for both our teachers and learners. Yet, 45% of Europeans, nearly 230 million people, have either very low or no digital skills at all. Amongst young people, the picture is better. By 2013, more than 90% of young Europeans had used the internet. But is using the internet enough nowadays? Being able to use Google is not the same as being digitally competent. And posting on Facebook is not the same as participating in the digital world. Being able to tell fake from real news and finding good and trustworthy information takes more than access to a computer or a smartphone. To give another example, only 20% of young Europeans have ever tried to write a computer program. Of course, being able to code is not and should not be the ultimate goal. Rather, young people need to develop a digital competence that enables them to become active rather than passive users. To create new ideas, to innovate, to enjoy, and of course to have fun. They need to be equipped with the skills 
and knowledge to understand the algorithms that dictate so much in our world and critically evaluate and question the information they are flooded with today. Our young generation needs the tools and competencies to become not just consumers, but active creators and leaders of the digital world. I would like to also stress the point of the gender gap in ICT and STEM more widely. The PISA results last month published by the OECD confirmed this issue is still relevant today. Boys are much more likely to be the top performers in science. In only one country, Finland, girls are more likely to be the top performers. Boys are also far more likely to want a career in the ICT sector, while few girls in Europe choose studies related to ICT. And those girls that graduate with ICT degrees often don't choose ICT careers. In fact, only a fraction of female tech graduates go on to work in this booming sector. Women remain underrepresented among tech entrepreneurs in management and decision making. Those women who do work in the ICT sector earn almost 9% more than in other, in, in other parts of the economy. They have greater flexibility in working schedules and are less vulnerable to unemployment. So the current situation is damaging women's interests. It is a huge waste of their potential and a huge loss for Europe's society and economy as a whole. Therefore, we need better digital skills and more access to ICT careers for girls. Technology is equally important for girls' lives as for boys. And crucially, we need to combat stereotypes and misconceptions about women and girls in science and tech. We need strong commitment and leadership, politicians, business leaders, parents and other role models all need to make this a priority. Governments, industry, universities, schools and other stakeholders all have crucial roles to play. Turning now to the changing role of schools and higher education. Schools, of course, uh, are not going to disappear from our towns and cities. Not in the near future. <laughs> the simply, there simply is no better structure or model to help our young people learn and understand the world we live in. But the education content, what is taught, and the methods, how we teach and learn, they need to change. Why are populist and nationalist parties rising across the EU? Why are so many people, young and old, falling for fake news stories? Why are so many Europeans struggling to find their place, both in the world of work, but also in social and civil life? The root causes of these issues are complex. We might never understand them fully. But we do know that the feeling of being left aside or being isolated play a role. Fear of others and fear of the future lead us to look for connection and meaning. And this is what religious and political movements can exploit. The most impactful and possibly the most effective tool that we have at hand to address these issues is education. Good education on its own won't be enough if other social and economic issues are not addressed. But schools can and must help to prevent and protect young people against marginalization, disenchantment and radicalization. There is some good news, such as in the fight against early school leaving. In 2002, 70% of young people left school without a diploma. Now the number stands at 11%, but that still means one in 10 young adults is left with a difficult pathway in life. We have also made progress with the European Youth Guarantee, a promise to provide either employment or education and training to all young Europeans. Nine million young people have got a job 
traineeship or apprenticeship through this scheme in the past three years. Later this year, the Commission will publish a policy package on school education. The aim is to help equip young people across the EU with a broader set of competencies to enable them to find fulfilling jobs and be active citizens, contributing to the well-being of our societies. We will support efforts across the EU to ensure that governance of education systems from early childhood education up to secondary schools supports innovation, inclusivity and key competencies. In particular, this will of course include an effort to achieve high standards of quality and professionalism of both teachers and school leaders. For higher and vocational education, the challenges are somewhat different. Of course, there too, the question will remain, what is taught and how it is taught? The campus will remain a central place for learning and a place where young adults find their path in life. But as technology develops further, digital tools will allow teaching at different scale, with more flexible timing, with more impact, and to more people. Without a doubt, lifelong upskilling is in many careers already an expected norm, and career changes are becoming the rule rather than the exception. Higher education institutions need to define their role in this shifting world. Should they continue to focus on teaching students on campus? Provide distance degrees for older adults? Or should they try to open up further to provide dynamic online learning offers for all learners? And if they do, who will finance these offers? And what role will today's teaching staff have? These are key policy questions, and today and tomorrow we'll hear expert views and forecasts on the future of learning, and maybe we'll get a glimpse of what future higher education institutions will look like. In May, we'll present a policy package on the modernization of higher education, which reviews and updates the agenda adopted in 2011. Obviously, Today, the world is more digital and we will reflect this in the new agenda. For example, we will look into promoting student-centered learning and teaching, including the effective use of rapidly evolving digital technologies. We will look into a more intelligent deployment of digital networking and collaboration technologies to support cooperation between higher education institutions <coughs> and outside actors. We'll, of course, also feed in the results of yesterday's joint meeting of the working groups on higher education and digital skills and competences. Many excellent examples on supporting digital age teaching from both government and institutions were presented during that day, I understand. But looking at skills forecasting and partnership models, I would like to mention the European Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition, which was launched uh, a month ago, and it will, be a key, it will be key to ensuring that education teaches for the real world and that skills, jobs, and educational provision find a better match. So, Looking at all of this, I think you will all agree that digital transformation brings both new and old challenges to the fore. Education systems need to focus on teacher training at all levels of education. Curricular development and educational materials need to become more flexible and yet more open and forward-looking. Technology and infrastructure constantly need to be maintained and kept up to date. We need to use the dynamics of grassroots educational initiatives and work hand in hand with them. Non-formal, informal and formal education have to work closer together. We have seen some great examples of this, such as the EU Code Week last October, which has made a record by mobilizing one million people 
from more than 50 countries to code in more than 23,000 events. And of course, we should not forget the need for effective pedagogies to ensure that education provides those competencies that students actually need and want. So, are our schools and higher education institutions up to the challenge? I believe the answer must be a resounding yes. Let this conference be a milestone, a moment to take stock of digital education, to look at what works and honestly to look at what doesn't work. There are many issues that we'll have to resolve, but there are even more opportunities that we are well positioned to take up. Our education systems are amongst the best in the world and together we can make sure that they will get even better. So let us continue to ask the right questions and let us work together on finding the best possible answers. I wish you a great conference. I'm very much looking forward to the outcome and the conclusions of this conference. And I wish you a lot of inspiring discussions. Thank you very much.